Welcome to our discussion of the first Texans. And by the first Texans, we of course mean the Native American people who lived here before the Europeans arrived. In this course, we're going to use the word, which is commonly used to describe the Native Americans, the word Indians. Now, of course, they are not Indians from the country of South Asia, but rather, as you've probably learned before, they're commonly called Indians, including by the Native American people themselves, because when Christopher Columbus arrived in the Caribbean in 1492, he thought he had arrived in the country of, the, of India. So Christopher Columbus thought he had arrived in the country of India in East Asia. Because if you look at a globe, Christopher Columbus, as you probably learned before, was by profession a navigator before he led his famous voyage. He had calculated beforehand exactly how he thought he was going to arrive in East Asia for the riches. And what he did was <clears throat> his calculation of latitude, latitude of course is the distance north or south of the equator, was pretty accurate. And if you take a globe and look at India and spin the globe around and you end up in the Caribbean, give or take a few hundred miles. However, his calculation of longitude, in other words, the distance traveling east and west, was much less than it would take to reach China because he and others had thought that the circumference of the, of the earth was much, much smaller than it is in reality. No one in Europe realized there was a huge land mass, what we now call the Western Hemisphere, across the Atlantic Ocean from Europe. So he called the people Indians. It took a while for the Europeans to figure out that, re oh, they aren't from Asia. This is a new land mass. And, but the name stuck. And again, many, most Native American tribal groupings today call themselves Indians, so it's not considered a term of insult by the Native Americans. Okay, another phrase you'll hear a lot in this module and the next one will be contact. Contact. By contact, we mean contact of the Native Americans or Indians with Europeans, whether they're French or Spanish explorers, and later, of course, uh, English and, and Dutch explorers on the east coast of the United States. So you'll hear the phrase pre-contact, that's before the Indians had contact with the Europeans, and then post-contact. Okay, let's look very, very briefly at the regions of Texas. There is a video in the module, a very good video for about 15 minutes, that will explain this in more detail, and it has some great um, views of the regions of Texas. So I highly encourage that you watch it. Well, as you can see from this very simple uh, map of the regions, Houston's located on the Gulf Coast, obviously of the Gulf of Mexico. To the north are the Piney Woods in East Texas. A lot of thick forest there. Moving from the Piney Woods west, you have what's called the Prairies and Lakes. This is where Dallas and Fort Worth are. You go further to the west and you have what's called the Panhandle. And these are plains. You know, today, no real forests. Uh, there's a lot of agriculture there using irrigation from water that's pumped up from under the ground. It's called a Panhandle because if you look at the state of Texas and you pretended it was sort of a a cooking utensil, that would be the handle, right? The, the top part of that that sticks up, you'd put your hand there, that would be the handle. Coming south from the panhandle, you have in Brown Hill Country, and this is where you have Austin and Sa San Antonio, sort of the southern part of that. And if you haven't been there, it's a lovely area to go. 
it goes for quite a while and there are hills, not real mountains, but hills. Um, and it's a good area for cattle ranching. And then coming to the south, we have the South Texas Plains, as you can see in yellow, which goes down to our current border with Mexico. And in the far west, you have Big Bend country. Why would that be called Big Bend? Well, just look at the southern part of uh, the state. You see there's a Big Bend that goes down. So going from the Gulf of Mexico, the, uh, the border of the state, goes in the northwesterly direction, then all of a sudden it goes down and up. And of course, that's the Rio Grande River. Um, and that's the path of the Rio Grande River. Um, there in Big Bend, there's a park well worth visiting called Big Bend Park. It's one of the least visited national parks in the US because it's a bit isolated, very dramatic canyons. I remember in college, um, driving from Austin, where I was in school at the University of Texas with some friends. We drove there and we uh, bought a cheap rubber raft and we rafted through the rapids in the canyon. And when I think back on it, it was a stupid thing to do, but I was like 19 at the time because we just, we didn't know what we were doing, frankly, but I suggest if you go, you go with a proper or, um, company that knows how to go through the canyons. And it's really beautiful, beautiful scenery out there. Okay, as I mentioned, be sure and watch the video on Texas geography. It will go into more detail. And I guarantee you, it will help you throughout this course to know where the regions are and the major rivers. Okay, where should we start at the very beginning? How did we get people in Texas? The most widely held view is that they came from Siberia. They crossed what's now the Bering Strait up near the state of Alaska. This was in an area, in an era rather, <clears throat> when that became a land bridge and the people migrated down uh, through Canada through North America. And as you can see in this slide, this is the most widespread view among archaeologists how the people came. They came down North America, down through Central America, finally down throughout uh, South America. Now, some people have started questioning this view in the last couple of years because down in the southern part of South America, in the country of Chile, they found archaeological ruins, which they have determined are thousands of years older than any archaeological ruins or evidence of people in North America. So some people think that perhaps rather than traveling overland, the people came from Siberia, some of them at least, in boats along the coast and you know went down the coast and eventually some people reached and settled in South America before uh, there was much population in North America. Or it may simply mean that they haven't found yet the archaeological sites which show evidence of early people uh, north of Chile. Some archaeologists have said, well, people crossed the Pacific Ocean in large boats from islands near uh, Australia. While that's possible, there's been real no, no real evidence of that. It's quite a huge distance. So, but this again is, is the conventional view. <clears throat> now, let's look at America here the Indian groupings or tribes, we could call them, were very complex and there were many of them. And the variation among them was largely determined by the environment where they lived. This is a Spanish drawing of Indians they encountered um, in the northern part of Cal what's now California. And you can see they have a lot of fish in the baskets, lots of fruit, 
Um, and of course, they're near the coast, so they had a lot of fish. This slide has a great representation of the major Indian groupings um, in North America. And this does certainly not include all of them, but the major ones. And don't worry, you don't need to know every one of these for an exam. But let's just take a minute to go through this. You can see in the northern part of Canada, or what they call the Arctic, you know, the Arctic Indians, the ones we all think of that live in, es in ice houses, Eskimos, whatnot. Then the subarctic. And then as we move down, in the center of the United States, you can see, and I've circled it in red, the Great Plains. Because this area is characterized by plains, flat areas with extensive grass. And in those, and in the Great Plains, you have, you had then large, large mammals. The, the mammoth, which were the, the, the dinosaurs, and then afterwards, the buffalo or bison, which are huge animals. And so the Indians in that area would hunt them. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Then as you come down to where present day Texas is, you see part of that consists of the Great Plains. And if you look there at some of the Indian tribes, you have the Comanche there. And we'll talk a lot about the Comanche in this course. And then from Texas, if you move to the east towards Florida, you can see I've circled the word Southeast. These are the Southeast Indian tribes or groupings. And this area is characterized by warm weather and heavy forests. So that whole area was heavily forested. And you can see in what's now Texas, the Wichita Indians and the Caddo Indians. More on the Caddo Indians in a moment. And, and then down along the... Uh, so you can see here in Texas, we have two groupings of Indians that differ significantly because of where they live. And indeed, if you go out to West Texas, and that's part of the brownish color that's labeled Southwest on the map. It extends all the way from Central America up. That's very dry, arid land. Not quite desert, it's not desert like in the Saharan Desert in Africa, but it's very dry land. And if you look there, you can see the Rio Grande River, uh, which is the southern border of Texas, and you can see uh, the Apaches, okay? Now, this is from the southwest region of Indians. This slide is not in Texas. This is to the west of Texas. They have ruins like this in, um, this one is in Colorado. They have similar ones uh, in New Mexico and Arizona. <coughs> and these, where you can see large caves that were open, which protected them from heavy rain or the sun. And they'd build these uh, multi-story buildings out of bricks, which they made from the mud and straw. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So now let's focus on India. Um, excuse me, in Texas itself. Uh, this is a very good map showing the major Indian groupings. And you can see at the north, uh, near the panhandle, we have what's called the Plains culture. I've circled in red the Comanche. In this lecture, the Comanche will be a small grouping up there. I won't really talk about them. But later, they become much more powerful once they get horses from the Spaniards. And they will take over much of Texas for, for many, many years. We have the Apaches there. We have on the eastern side, the southeastern culture. You see the Caddo there. And then we have below that, in red, the Atacapan. We'll talk about in a minute. Then down in the oranges color, we have the Gulf culture. And there you can see the Atacapan and the Karankawas, as well as the Kawitakans. I'll mention those briefly in the lecture. <coughs> 
And then we go over to the green area um, and we, in West Texas, and we have some of the Apaches, and then we have near Big Bend, the Jumano. So the groupings and their cultures are largely determined by where they live and the environment. <coughs> Excuse me. So first of all, the first Indians that came into Texas, they encountered a climate different than the climate we have today. <coughs> there have been many episodes of climate change in the past during human um, habitation. Um, and we're not talking now about the Great Ice Age. But after the Ice Age, there was Texas... Um, had became warmer. Obviously, the ice retreated. And the area of the Panhandle was much cooler in the summer then and warmer in the winter. Because if anyone has been in the Panhandle, it's really hot in the summer. It's as bad or worse than Houston. And much, much colder in the winter with um, heavy snow. And it also had twice as much rain then as now. So this meant there was much more vegetation. This would attract the big animals that the humans wanted to kill and eat. And not only would they eat them, but as you likely know, when they killed the buffalo, they used the hides to make coats or to make to cover their um, their tents. Um, and how did they kill them? Well, they obviously didn't have firearms then. They they used spears. And they made they used a type of rock called flint, which they used other rocks to break down and sharpen, and they would go up with the spear and kill a buffalo. That might if you've ever seen a buffalo, they're huge animals, and it must have been quite dangerous to get within five or six feet of them with a spear. They did not have a bow and arrow at this point. The bow and arrow, of course, gave the advantage they didn't have to stand next to a buffalo and stick a spear into it, and the buffalo obviously is going to turn on you if you do that. So the mammoth, which were dinosaurs, they declined about 11,000 years ago. They were hunted by the early humans in the area, and in fact, they have found in archaeological sites in Houston, in, Houston, in Texas, mammoth bones with spears actually in the bones. You could actually see the spear point, the actual spear point in, in the bone. But now as the mammoths declined in population, the hunting focused on the buffalo. Now this led, this is an important point, to complex social organization. You don't have just a little family living in a cave and the man going out trying to kill buffaloes because the buffaloes are in huge herds. And so people would go get together and they would come up with a strategy to kill the buffalo. And one of the famous early strategies was in the Great Plains, it's not entirely flat. I mean, you may have the image it's entirely flat. No, there are areas, many areas, where there are sharp drops or cliffs, and those cliffs may be 10, 20, 30 feet. So what they would want to do is force the buffalo to run over the cliff, fall down 10 or 15 feet, which would break their legs. And at the bottom of the cliff, it was easy because to kill the buffalo because they were on the ground and couldn't move. And then they would, they would often take the meat from the buffalo there. They would eat some fresh, I mean, cook it, obviously, or they would smoke it. They would take it back to the camp and they would put it in a tent with a fire and lots of smoke. And that meat would last for a year or two. And right now we have what's called jerky. You've probably seen it in the supermarket, which many people use actually when they go out hunting or hiking. It's the same thing. It's dried meat and it lasts a long time. So the buffalo hunt, how did they get the buffalo to run off the cliffs? Well, they would look at the wind 
and on a day when the wind was blowing towards the cliff, the top of the cliff, they would light the the people would light the grass on fire, and the smoke would go against the buffalo, and the fire would move towards the buffalo. There'd be thousands of them, and the buffalo obviously didn't want to be engulfed in the flames and the smoke, so they would run in the opposite direction, and lo and behold, the opposite direction turned out to be the top of a cliff, and many thousands and thousands of buffaloes would um, die uh, falling off the cliff. Now, once they learned how to make the arrowheads, the business of mining the rock used to make flints and actually the making of the flints led to populations being sedentary and staying there. And they would trade those flints with other population centers. There were other population centers near rivers, obviously a source of water, as well as fish and canyons. Now, in contrast, coastal Texas the area you know, around Houston, all the way down the coast uh, to what's now Mexico. That did not uh, have buffalo because it didn't have the, the grass needed by the buffalo, nor did eastern Texas where the forests are. I mean, the forests were very thick. There was no room for the buffalo and it, there was no real food for the buffalo. So for that reason, east Texas, the Piney Woods area with the thick forest. To this very day, they're very thick forests in East Texas. And the coastal area uh, did not have the buffalo, so relatively few Indians lived in these areas. <clears throat> so the earliest uh, Indians were called hunter-gatherers. As the name suggests, they were hunters. They would hunt the, the uh, largely the, the buffalo, but also deer, and um, other animals for meat. And gatherers, what would they gather? Well, they would gather nuts from the trees, berries, fruits. The, at first, there was no agriculture. They would just go out and pick fruits uh, and eat that. And they were not sedentary. They moved constantly as the buffalo herds would move. <clears throat> but now they start to develop agriculture. And when you have agriculture, actually planting crops, whether it's, it's corn or squash or beans, the population can produce much more food. It also becomes um, a stable and doesn't need to move around. And this occurred about five or 6,000 years ago, after the hunter-gatherer societies. Now, this is in West Texas, um, in the lower Pecos River Valley. And this is a cave you can see there near the middle, slightly to the left of the middle of the photograph. That was a cave used by early hunter-gatherers. And they found many artifacts in the cave. And was, this is called Heinz Cave. Okay, these are some of the artifacts they found there. You can see at the top a bone that is sharpened into a knife. You can see, and it's amazing, the many thousands of years these have survived, baskets that they wove. And the reason the baskets uh, have partially survived is the climate is very, very dry there. Otherwise, in this area, in the Houston area, they would have rotted away in a few years. <clears throat> now, the archaeological sites from the early Indians show a lot of different animals and plants were eaten by the hunter-gatherers. They know this because archaeologists have found what they call the hearths, the areas where they cook the food and they find seeds from many animals or they find bones from many plants. <clears throat> they also... Now we're making baskets, all kinds of bags. Why would you need a bag? Well, if you're going to go out and collect nuts and berries, you have to put them somewhere, so you need a bag. They were making nets. You need nets, 
put across a small river to catch fish. And animal snares, these are devices like ropes you use to catch small animals. But as I put in red here in the slide, these early Texas Indians spent most of their time getting food. So most of their time was spent getting food. <clears throat> now, they found a number of paintings. We'll see some slides of them in a minute. In, in caves. And the reason they find them in caves is people lived in the caves and also having a painting on the wall of a cave is protected from the intense sun. It's also in, uh, protected from the rain. And there they find many images of animals that the people would hunt and eat. Also images of shamans. Shamans are the religious leaders. And these were people who claimed that they could they could communicate with the supernatural world and they were very, very important in the social hierarchy. And not just in Texas, this is virtually throughout the world at this time. And they also find many, many drawings of cougars. Cougars were very important for these people because they had to find the deer to kill and the cougars would hunt the deer so often people would see cougars and they'd follow the cougars and the cougars would take them to a big herd of deer. The deer was, of course, consumed the meat, but also the early people preferred deer to make clothing with because deer skin is not as tough and thick as buffalo skin. The buffalo skin was very useful to make a heavy coat or blankets. <clears throat> And you have all these different archaeological sites, and now we start seeing the population ex expanding. Along the coast, as I mentioned before, there weren't large animals like buffaloes. And so the early Texans hunted small game, you know, rabbits. But it was difficult to, you know, to kill a rabbit when you don't have a bow and arrow. Um, you just have a spear. So that was pretty difficult. But they also would uh, have roots of trees that were edible. They'd eat seeds and shellfish. Now turning to East Texas, the Indians did not have large game animals there. They had, and it was very difficult for them to kill deer because they didn't have a bow and arrow. And they didn't have the flints yet in East Texas to make the arrowheads. So they gathered plants to eat and they would capture small mammals or fish. And then the big change came about 1500 years ago when there was an agricultural revolution and it was truly a revolution among the Indians. Um, this is some examples of <clears throat> arrowheads uh, made of flint and you can see how they were chiseled. I don't know if any of you have been to Waco Tank State Park near El Paso. It's well worth the trip. I mean, it's about a 10-hour drive from Houston, but if you're out in the West Texas area, it's worth it. Waco is a Spanish word, which of course means a hole or a depression in a rock. Here we have in the map of Texas, I've circled way out in West Texas, Waco Tanks. You can see it's very near El Paso. And you can also see on this map uh, Big Bend National Park down there in the, the bend of the um, Rio Grande River. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I happened to be in El Paso on business a few years ago, and I'd always wanted to go to Waco Tanks. So I took an extra day vacation, rented a car, and drove there. And... Um, it's a state park. It's not very well visited because it's in the middle of nowhere, but it's worth visiting if you're in that area. Uh, this is a photo I took approaching uh, Waco Tank State Park. And as you can see, the area is very dry and flat there. It's a real desert. And this, you, ha you have this natural outcropping of rocks, which has been there many, many thousands of years. And the rocks 
are shaped in such a way that they have many depressions in the rocks. And that's why it's called Waco tanks, because when it rained, and it does rain in this very dry area, the rain would stay in these big depressions in the rocks. And if it wasn't hit too much by the sun, it would stay there. And of course, that would attract animals and that would attract people. People wanted to drink the water and they wanted to kill the animals. Now, the site is very popular to see the prehistoric drawings there, which I'll show you in a second. Also, many rock climbers go there because the type of rocks are considered a real challenge for rock climbers. <clears throat> well, the first thing you notice when you go there, they have these signs up all over the place, even in the parking lot. Beware of snakes, you know. Exercise caution when walking and, you know. And so everywhere you go, you, you see these big signs, beware of snakes. Um, there's a, it's not a very vi visited uh, park, but you go into the small park office and they have big on the wall they have these skins from huge rattlesnakes and you have to go out with a tour guide from the park so three or four of us just sort of arrived at the same time and we went out and we walked about 15 minutes to get to the area of interest to see the prehistoric rocks a uh, rock paintings well as we're walking there this is what we see. This is like 20 feet away. This is what we see about 20 feet away. Uh, I took this with a telephoto lens. Uh, and it's a nice sunny day. So the snakes being uh, reptiles are out enjoying the sun warming up. Uh, when I saw this, I got like on the other side of the park ranger because uh, I realized it's the snakes habitat and all, but I'm a bit terrified of these creatures. So anyway, let's get rid of that slide. It makes me nervous looking at. So to see uh, the first set of rock, prehistoric rock drawings, we had to crawl on our back under in this small opening and we were given special flashlights that would not damage the paint, the prehistoric paint. And so the ranger tells us, well, we can only go in this little overhang when it's sunny outside because the rattlesnakes live in there, many of them, and they come out during the day to enjoy the sun and warm up. And we're, the three or four of us there are looking at each other. Well, do the rattlesnakes do us a sunny day? And the ranger said, of course, of course, go in, go in. So these two brave people got on their backs and slid in under there. Uh, fortunately, there were no rattlesnakes in there. Um, so <clears throat> I went in after them. And this is one of the drawings I saw. You can see clearly an animal here. And here, it's a little harder to see, but there's an animal, a hoofed animal, and you can see clearly the head and the body. This is... A photograph I didn't take this this was elsewhere in the park which you see and you can see in here a person who is believed to be the shaman or the priest of the people now moving from West Texas all the way to the other extreme of this uh, side of the state into East Texas <coughs> we have the Caddo uh, tribe or grouping of people and in the year 700 A.D. or C.E., let me explain this difference now. Um, when I grew up, and traditionally, the year zero was the birth year of Jesus Christ, um, and you know, set by the Christians, and so the years after. Year zero were called A.D., which in Latin means after God or after Christ. B.C. were the years before the year zero, before Christ was born. For instance, ancient Egypt and ancient Greece, 
and that was called BC, before Christ. Well, in the last 20 or 30 years, many people have said, well, that system for dating, for dates, is very Christian-centric. I mean, it focuses on the birth of Christ, and there are many people in the world who do not believe Jesus Christ is the Savior, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So let's have something that's more neutral. So instead of A.D., the the phrase common era or CE is used. It means exactly the same thing because the year zero is the same. So the year 700 AD or CE is the same. And instead of BC, before Christ, those years are now called before the common era or BCE. So I know it's very confusing. I grew up, everyone of my age, what was BC or AD And so sometimes I get them mixed up. I apologize. In this course, after this lecture, we'll never talk about a year that is before the year zero, either BC or BCE. Okay. So, so we're now in the year 700 um, AD or CE. The Caddo resided in Eastern Texas you know, in the area of heavy forests. And they grew corn, squash, and sunflowers. And they moved to Texas. Unlike the other Indians, they didn't come from the north or the west. They came from the east, from the Mississippi River Valley. Remember we saw before the southeastern Indian groupings. They lived in grass houses, large houses they made. They cleared the forest and they planted corn, and then they, they would s- store some of the corn to use as seed in subsequent uh, years. And you may recall from your earlier studies that the Europeans did not have corn. The corn first started, it was in uh, Mexico, and then it spread throughout uh, among the Indians in the Western Hemisphere. So here we see the Caddo homeland, uh, which you can see is in eastern Texas. And what's amazing on this map and why I like it is you can see how far they traded. Look at there in the northwest, I mean, excuse me, northeast, up near Chicago, and they traded copper all the way up there. They would trade corn and other products to get the copper On the west, all the way in what's now the state of New Mexico, they would get turquoise stones. They would get cotton from down near what's now the Mexican border. So they had extensive trading networks. The Cotto hunters would use stone-tipped weapons. Uh, They didn't have flint. They had stones, which is more difficult to chisel down into a point, but they used that. And they made storage containers out of ceramics. And they would weave reed baskets. And the the hunters were all men, and the women would process small mammals, mammals. They would butcher them and cook the meat and smoke the meat. And the same thing for the bison or buffalo. I already mentioned and showed you a map of how the Caddo would trade at long distance with other Texas Indians, and indeed, far outside of Texas. And that really provided the foundation, we'll see later, for trade and commerce once the Europeans arrived in Texas. The, the The Caddo political and spiritual authority was passed down through the men and the men family that's patrilineally. But the families themselves were matrilineal. In other words, focused on the mother's family. And the Caddo population really, really in the culture reached its peak from around 800 to 1350. And remember the Europeans arrived the earliest in the 1500s. You know, Christopher Columbus came in 1492. So their population 
was already declining by the time the Europeans arrived. Now, why did their, their culture and many other Indian cultures start declining? Well, one reason was climate change. There started to be much less rain, so they couldn't grow as much corn. The, uh, the animals started moving to areas where there was more rain. <clears throat> and then starting in the 1500s, when the Europeans arrived, the Europeans did not purposely infect the Indians with their diseases. Because at that time, of course, no one in Europe had any clue as to what caused disease. The, the feeling was it was it was God, it was a supernatural punishment to people, or it was something in the night air, the night vapors, they call it. Well, whatever, the Europeans arrived, and you probably studied this before, part of the so-called Columbia, Columbian exchange between Europe, Africa, and the Western Hemisphere, the Europeans would arrive. There was much smallpox in Europe, killed many, many people in Europe, as did other diseases such as cholera, measles, influenza, which is a bad case of the flu, and other diseases would kill many, many, many people in Europe. But not everybody in Europe died. Some people just got sick and survived. And those Europeans then developed what's called an acquired immunity from having exposure. For instance, measles, the same thing. Um, Chickenpox, the same thing. Well, the Europeans arrived in, and this is not just in Texas, throughout the Western Hemisphere. And the native population of the Indians had had zero exposure to these diseases. And, at, and as a result, and as a result, as a result, the Europeans um, just being around them and things, people got these diseases. And the estimates are between 80, 90 percent of the Indian population died of these diseases. Particularly Indians who were like the Caddo in population centers. One person would get the disease and it would easily be passed. And what would happen is because people didn't understand the germ theory of uh, disease, Let's say someone is there with smallpox or cholera, one of the Indians. Well, the family would come around and comfort the person. Obviously, no one wore masks or anything. And everybody would get infected. And not all died, but many, many died. Um, I'm sure you've studied this before, um, but just to refresh your memory. Um, it was not really, I would classify it as biological warf war warfare because the Europeans didn't know how these diseases were transmitted. And Europeans died of these diseases. Europeans in what's now the United States would die of cholera, even in cities as far north as Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in the 1800s. There were major outbreaks of cholera and many you know, Europeans, many white people would die. Um, but because the Indians had had zero exposure a high, high percentage of them died. <clears throat> and so, and this particularly hit, again, groups like the Caddo that were in, a, um, in small villages together. Groups out on the plains that moved all the time and whatnot, like the Apaches, the Comanches, relatively few of them died because they were constantly moving around. So for the Caddo's, the population really dropped from about 200,000 to 1,500, that's before the Europeans arrived, to about 15, 200,000 to about 15,000, 200 years later in 1700. Now the, the Caddo's built many bound, merry, mounds. They would pile up the dirt. Some of them, like this one, is a burial mound, which you can go see at the Caddo Mound State Park, which is in uh, northeast uh, Texas. Uh, the others, they believe, were ceremonial centers because underneath they would find ceremonial objects. 
This is a, a replica of a traditional Caddo grass hut, a house at the same park. And these houses are huge. They're 50 or 60 feet across. And many families would live in there. The beds were put up off the ground around the edge. And the reason the grass houses haven't survived is obviously this is in the forest. It's rainy. It's tropical. Not tropical. It's rainy and humid. And vegetation doesn't last very long. So in general the Indians in the United States did not build massive stone structures like the Aztecs in Mexico or the Mayas or the Incas in South America, you know, places like um, Inga Pieca or Machu Picchu in South America because they used either wood or grass with some exceptions. Um, and here we have pottery, you can see it's very well made, and you can see the different geometric designs on the pottery. <clears throat> it's interesting, where does the word Texas come from, the name of the state? Well, the Caddo word Texas means friend. Well, the Spanish took that word and used it to describe all the Caddo people. people. Now, the Spanish wrote it T-E-J-A-S because it's like Tejas in Spanish. And the way the Caddo word word T-E-C-H-A-S was pronounced, at least as the Spanish heard it, was like Tejas. So they wrote it down as T-E-J-A-S. And of course, for those of you who speak Spanish, a J and X have the same sound as Spanish. So the J became an X. So it's it's still Tejas in Spanish. Um, and, you know, here in Texas, English speakers say Texas. And this word was first used in 1689 to describe the entire geographic area. And just interesting, the Texas state motto is friendship. And, you know, that reflects the Caddo heritage because the word Texas, as I mentioned, comes from the Caddo Caddo word, which means friend. And we talked in the, in the last lecture about the mythology of Texas and the image of Texas. And I think personally, part of that is Texans are very friendly people. I think Texans pride themselves on that. And generally people in the South pride themselves on being friendly and hospitable. Although, as I always joke, that's until people get behind a car and everybody everywhere seems to be rude when they're driving, particularly at rush hour. Okay, now let's turn quickly um, to the coastal Texas Indians. Now along the coast, you had flooding and hurricanes, poor soil, and there were heavy, heavy rain. And so it really, you couldn't really have fairly primitive agriculture. So there were real no real large population centers on the coast. Uh, some of the groups that we looked at uh, in the general map of the Texas Indians were the Atacapans. They hunted small mammals and alligators. And how did they kill the alligators? Well, alligators are pretty ferocious, but they would take their spear, which was a piece of wood with a sharp uh, stone in the front or just a piece of, of wood, um, carved to be like a spike and they would stick it into the ear it should be into the eyes of the alligator and that would kill it they would eat the alligator meat but they particularly valued the alligator oil which somehow they figured out when spread on their body kept the insects and particularly the mosquitoes away and it was important to keep the mosquitoes away not just for, um, you know, the nuisance of the mosquito bites, but also uh, they could carry disease. And the Atacapans lived in migratory bands. They would move around. They didn't really have much political structure we know of or connections to other bands. The word Atacapa actually means eaters of men in the language of the Choctaw Indians. So the Choctaw Indians would call them eaters of men, and 
Uh, that's where we get the word Atacapa. Now, the Atacapans practiced ritualistic cannibalism of enemies. So when they would kill an enemy soldier, they would, the whole group would eat bits of the enemy soldier. And so it was a ritual. Most other Texas Indian groups did that. Now, the Choctaw didn't. That's why they called the Atacapans eaters of men. They looked down on it. But most other Texas Indian groups did this. And we don't believe the Atacapans ate other human beings on a regular basis as a source of nutrition, but it was, again, part of this ritual. <clears throat> and the Atacapans and other Indians in Texas and elsewhere believed that by eating one of your enemies, it prevented that person from enter, having a second life. It also, therefore, eternally damned that person so they could not rise up again. Then moving south along the coast, we have the Karankawas. The Karankawas were a much more um, prosperous group of uh, Indians at this time. They lived from Galveston Bay, just south of us, all the way down the coast to Corpus Christi Bay. They built canals uh, because there are many rivers, also go along the coast. They lived in wigwams. They raised dogs. And like the Atacapans, they hunted small mammals and alligators. And again, alligators both for the meat, you know, big alligator would have a lot of meat, and also for the alligator oil. Now, when the Spaniards arrived, and we'll see the Spaniards starting the next, next lecture, they really said that Catacancas are different than the other Indians on the coast because they're much taller and have many more muscles. And that's probably because they had a much better diet. <clears throat> so here we have the Karankawa. The top map just shows um, where we are in the United States. The bottom map shows um, the uh, in red the Karankawa area. And I found this on the internet and it's in German there. The Gulf of Mexico is in German. But uh, our, for our focus, you can see where the Karankawa were. And you can see the barrier islands there off the coast. And they would go along those in uh, canoes. Now, when the Spanish arrived, the first Indians they found in Texas were the Karankawas. And the Karankawas called them cannibals because the Karankawas also would consume bits of their enemies as a revenge. Or the, Kar the Karankawas thought, well, if the enemy soldiers were particularly courageous by eating some of them, we might be able to capture their courage. And it's very interesting, later, once the Spaniards arrive, the Spaniards, as we'll see in some great detail, arrived not just soldiers, but also many, many Christian or Catholic uh, priests and monks who want to convert the Indians to the Catholic religion. And among these Texas Indians, they found, the, the Spanish priests found it fairly easy to convince them about the Christian or Christian and also Catholic sacrament of the communion or Eucharist because for all Christians, the Eucharist uh, piece of bread, the host, is symbolic of the Christ, the body of Jesus Christ. For Catholics, not for Protestants, but for Catholics, during the religious uh, mass, the Catholics believe that the piece of bread, the host, is physically converted into the actual body of Christ. And the same thing for the wine, into the actual blood of Christ. And that's, you probably know, a major difference between the Catholic religion and Protestant religions. They're all Christian, but the, uh, the Eucharist is seen differently. Well, any event, and so the 
the Catholic priests arrived and started to explain to the uh, Indians through interpreters about the Eucharist and for the, many of the Texas Indians who practice this ritualistic cannibalism, they'll say, well, that makes sense. We consume bits of our enemies to capture their courage. So, so it makes sense that in your religion, we eat uh, the piece of bread and that's actually the body of Christ. And so we can capture the goodness of Christ. And we'll see more about all that later. Okay, this is a Spanish drawing of the Kanakawa Indians. You can see how tall they are. And another tribe near the Gulf Coast, in the very south, are the Quelitecans. And they were in small bands. They were very, very poor. They hunted whatever game they could find there. They ate the fruit of the cactus, which in Spanish is called tuna, T-U-N-A. I know it sounds like a a fish, but it's in Spanish called tuna. Actually, they sell them in my local grocery store. Uh, they would eat pecan nuts and roots. They really didn't have much to eat, so they'd eat any insect they'd find, any reptile, including snakes, and many, many plants that the Spanish considered to, to be unhealthy. They didn't, so they'd have gourds, you know, they would hollow out the gourds, things like pumpkins or something, and preserve their food there because they did not have ceramic containers or even baskets that we know of. Well, when the Spanish encountered them, they thought they were so poor and they really needed missionary activity. So the Spanish started putting missions there. We'll see the missions later where they they build a church, they bring the Indians in, uh, convert them to become Catholics and have programs to try and educate them. And the Qualitecans were really the only Indian group in Texas that really welcomed the Spanish missionaries because they were so poor, you know, this was really a step up for them physically. Now let's move quickly to West Texas. <coughs> Sorry, this lecture is lasting a long time. Uh, as we saw before at the very beginning of the lecture, the hunter-gatherers lived in rock shelters or caves. And from West Texas, they moved into Mexico, New Mexico, and the Plains. One prominent group there were the Jumanos, and they traded with the Caddo in East Texas. They also traded with the Pueblo Indians in New Mexico, as well as the Spanish later when they, throughout the Rio Grande River Valley. The Jumanos lived in adobe brick houses, homes. Adobe is mud uh, mixed with straw, and they cut it into bricks and put it out in the sun. And people still use it today, actually, in various countries. But after contact with the Europeans, the Jumano population declined rapidly. And that was largely because of um, diseases transmitted by the Europeans, which we talked about earlier. Here, um, there actually are some ruins of the Humano people. This is in eastern New Mexico, just outside of Texas. And here, I drew these red lines in the map. They're, this is to show how those towers provided a form of natural air conditioning because it's very hot in this area in the day. And the towers were hollow and they would draw the air through. The Apache, the Apache Indians started in the Rocky Mountains to the west of Texas, and they traveled down them into New Mexico and West Texas. And at the time we're talking about, they were centered in the Panhandle as well as the Plains. And there were two main groupings of Apaches in uh, Texas. The Lipant Apaches were in the northern and central part, and the Mescalero Apaches were west of the Pecos River. Very typical of Indian cultures in general throughout the United States, the women 
practiced agriculture while the men hunted buffalo. And the men felt it was beneath them to engage in agriculture. And we'll see the problems this uh, presents much later on in the course um, when the Indians are put in reservations and the men don't want to do agriculture, etc. So the men were, would be hunters or they'd be warriors, soldiers. And the women did the agriculture. Then they had extended families which formed bands. And rather than having the leader determined by heredity, which was so common in many other Indian tribes, for the Apaches, they actually would get together and decide who would be the political leader as well as the spiritual leader. Here we have an early drawing of um, a Lipin Apache warrior. This was taken much later because the Spaniards, of course, brought horses over. And here you have a warrior with a, um, with a rifle. And in Apache society, they particularly honored warriors who were successful, the men who were successful in battle. Because, as I'll talk about in one moment when we finish this lecture, there were many, many battles or warfare among the Indian tribes. And the Apaches particularly respected a man who could go up to a living enemy and touch him. You know, get that close. Or take prisoners. And what were the prisoners used for? This may surprise you. They were used as slaves. So they wouldn't try and kill all the enemy warriors. They would like, they would want very much to take prisoners and take those prisoners back. And those were slaves. This is very common in many, many Indian cultures in the Western Hemisphere before the Europeans arrived. I think most people think, well, there was no slavery in the Western Hemisphere until the Europeans arrived. That's not true. Uh, they would take uh, prisoners. And among the Aztecs in uh, central, Me central Mexico, uh, the Aztecs would go out and they'd often use wooden swords and they would try not to kill their enemies They would because they would take them back to either be slaves or to sacrifice them uh, because the Aztecs believed as part of their religious system that they had to open up the chest of a living person, pull out the beating heart and offer it to the sun god. The same thing for the Mayas in northern Central America, southern Mexico, and even among the Incas. And there was a lot of slavery among the Indians from prisoners from other Indian tribes. Okay, here we still have um, the Apache. They use something called the travois. That's a French word because the French saw this and wrote about it to transport their belongings. At first they used dogs, and then after the Spanish arrived, they started using horses. So this is really, I think, pretty interesting. So here you have a horse, but you can imagine a big dog too. And you have it pulling the belongings like this. They didn't have the wheel. None of these Indians had the wheel. So the stick, the piece of wood at the end would just drag along the ground. And they'd put there their belongings, you know, the things they slept on, their pots, whatever. And then when they got, and they were moving around a lot because they were chasing the buffalo and the buffalo would sort of move. So when they got to where they're going to have a camp, they'd take this off the horse and you can see in the back there on the right, those were the poles used for their tent, their teepee tent. So they would push it up, put two or three of these up and they'd have a nice tent and unfold the buffalo skins which would be the outside of the tent. Now, we'll see later in the course, the Comanches were a small group up in northern Texas. A little later, in terms of time, they moved south and they came to dominate all of central Texas. And the Comanches were fabulous uh, warriors. And in fact, they often beat the U.S. Army in battles.
The Apaches were forced to move. The Comanches attacked them, killed them, tried to enslave them. And those who weren't killed, the Apaches moved out. Excuse me, the Apaches moved out. And the final couple of slides here, I'd like to talk about the widespread myth that the Indians were living in peace and harmony until the Europeans arrived. And this is called the myth of the noble savage, which was very, very widespread in Europe. Europeans said, well, not all, but some Europeans, writers would say, well, when the Europeans arrived, they found the Indians and they were noble people living in harmony and peace and not at war with each other. And savage, they use the word savage because that's how Europeans viewed the natives in the Western Hemisphere, in Africa, well, everywhere. That they, you know, Europe was the center of civilization, of enlightenment, and the, uh, you know, and the, these Indians, you know, weren't even Christians. I mean, they must have been. They were savages. And the word savage then meant what it does now, someone totally you know, savage <laughs> without, um, in French, it's sauvage. It means the same thing. It's someone without any culture, without, you know, rules. So, but this became the myth. They're savages, but they're noble people because they live in peace and harmony and they live in the forest or on the plain. Um, but you go throughout the Western Hemisphere, starting in Alaska, Canada, down to the very tip of South America. The archaeological runes almost always show defensive constructions, walls, building up on a hill, whatever. And that was not defense against wild animals, but that was defense against other groups of Indians. There are many, 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 much evidence of warfare and sometimes slavery, not always, but slavery, which I mentioned before, and human sacrifice. And I already mentioned a couple of tribes in Texas with human sacrifice. Uh, and of course you had the Aztecs, Mayas, Incas, many, many of them. And indeed, let's look at the names of the tribes or, or groupings. The names that we use now to describe the Indians are names that other Indian tribes use to describe them. And they all mean an inferior grouping because every Indian tribe that we know of felt that they were superior to the other tribes. Just next, last, next and finally the last slide in this long lecture, let's just look at a few of these. So Apache, we just talked about the Apache. Well, they call themselves, I don't know how to pronounce it, N-D-E-E, -E, Nidi, or the people in their own language. And all the Indian groups, it was now the U.S., would essentially call themselves using a word in their language that meant the people because they didn't consider anyone else to be the people. But one of their rival tribes with which they fought often, the Zuni tribe, called them Apache, which in the Zuni language means enemy. And that was the same uh, for the Ute Indians. So what happened? The, the Spaniards arrived, or the French, whoever, or, or eastern part of the U.S., the British, they arrived, they met some Indians, you know, and they said, by the way, what is the name of the Indian group over there on the other side of the river? And let's say the Europeans are talking to the Zuni or Ute, and they'd say, oh, those guys, oh, we call them Apache in our language. In other words, the enemy. So the Europeans wrote down in their book, okay, that group is called the Apache. The Comanches, they call themselves Numini in their own language, which means the people. The Utes, another tribe, call them Comanche, which in the Ute language means people who are against us, like the enemy, okay? Okay. 
And last one for the Sioux Indians, which weren't in Texas. They were up further north near Canada in what's now South Dakota, North Dakota. They call themselves the Lakota or Dakota, which in their own language means friends or allies. By the way, the word Dakota is why we have two states named Dakota, North Dakota and South Dakota. And there's still many Sioux there. But the Chippewa tribe, which was at warfare with the Sioux, would call them the snake or the enemy. And in the Chippewa language, the word Sioux means snake or enemies. And, you know, if you, people have talked to Sioux Indians today and said, well, you know, you even call yourselves, well, they tend to call themselves Lakota or Dakota. But they said, well, we don't mind if people call us the Sioux now. I mean, for our ancestors, it was an insult, but not really now. Same thing for the Comanches, the Apaches, and the many, literally hundreds, if not thousands of Indian tribes that were in the United States. Okay, we'll see a lot more about the Indians as we progress in this course. And again, the Comanche will become dominant in much of Texas and the Spanish can't conquer them. The French can't conquer them. And in fact, as we'll see, when uh, Mexico became a country, they invited Americans, white Americans, to come in from the United States into Texas, because Texas, we'll see later, was part of Mexico, precisely to, to keep the Comanches away from uh, Mexico. Okay, and in the next lecture, we'll start looking at the first European explorers, the French and Spanish, coming into what's now Texas. Uh, thank you very much.